All right, I think we are live 30 seconds ago. 30 seconds ago? Yeah. Well, it's, yeah, according to that, I don't know. Um, hi, everybody. We're going to start in eight minutes and whatever the clock says. Uh, but in the meantime, I wanted to ask everybody to help us out with the microphones and the audio levels on the synth just so that... Um, you guys can hear everything because typically what happens when I do this is the mic is wrong immediately. So, you want to get that out of the way? yeah, let me know. So we definitely can't hear you. Let me know. Can you hear me okay? And can you hear, can you hear Michael okay? So, oh, is it? There you go. I can hear you in my headphones now. One, 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 one. Hey. You sound great in my headphones. I sure hope so. Yeah. I guess they can't hear me yet, but hopefully uh, soon you can hear me. Good. I just turned up Michael, so you should be able to hear him. All right. Check me out. Oh, I could hear myself a little bit there. Oh, good. I like that. I sound goose. Thanks, Paul. I hope I sound goose. You always sound goose. Yes, for Michael. Nice. Says Paul Nash. Can you hear us over? Michael is a bit quiet. Is it probably because I'm mumbling, though? I bet my gain is fine. I'm just... Uh, That's all the gain. That microphone really likes it when you, you get into it. You need me to get closer. Like you, can, you can move the mic, too. It's okay. So we both sound That's good. You can hear us over the, the synth and all that stuff. See, six minutes left to go, and I've already shown the thing. It's over. You, don't, it's over. you don't need to watch it. Hear the sine wave faintly. Weird. Are you listening on a wide band system? Because it's pretty bassy. That's a. Oh, uh, yeah. Sign has gone up in pitch significantly. All right, so we probably shouldn't do the bass side. That's not going to work. What? Well, yeah. This is going to drive us mad for an hour. Go. It's go nice a little and, lower. Nice and quiet. But if somebody's just listening on a laptop, they're not going to get the bass very well. Yeah. Good balance, I hear. Thanks, Pete. I appreciate the help. Levels seem good. Well, that's good enough for me. So for the next five minutes... This is my favorite sine wave. Is it? <laughs> it's a pretty good one. This is the... They can't see it yet, but this is the big O sine wave. This is that uh, the new uh, sign shaping circuit that you came up with. This is the first module that we use that in. Oh, right. Oh, awesome. Yeah, soon to be in the new instrument and also in the Voltage Lab 2 when that finds its way to the world. But currently... Captain Big O is the place to get it, and boy, does it, it shines, I should say. It's, uh, it. Yeah, there was no problem with the bass sign. I think it was just the playback of the person. Yeah. Uh, who made the comment. I think so. Others are saying the bass was. Yeah, Yotus can hear it. Yotus usually listens on a laptop with laptop speakers, so. Okay. If he can hear it, I think we're good. We may want to bring that pitch up. I don't think we do. <laughs> Grab some patch cables here. It's a good G note, is it? I don't have that pitch. I think I bumped. Maybe it's a pun. <laughs> Could be a pun. 
So this is Michael. This is the first time. No, no, you did a stream a long time ago. With, I've done a couple with Perry. I did that one with Perry. I did one in your living room. Oh, that's right. Yeah, yeah. But that's been a long time because I've been down here for over a year now. Yeah, it was a while ago. That was. If you were my living room, that was probably pre-COVID. It might have right at the very yeah. Beginning. I think it, I think it might have been. Yeah, I wow. turned out to be non-photogenic, <laughs> and I was banned. And you just f featured the photogenic Herman the rest of the time. Yeah, well, Herman was willing to stand in the thirty-three degree <laughs> backyard with me all no, winter. So that's seriously rough. Yeah, we had a few. We had a few of those shows that were miserable. Uh, they were so cold. The one day was cold and raining, which mm. was even better. Awful. <laughs> but now we do them in Herman's studio, which is a wonderful place to be. Nathaniel, that's uh, that's interesting. Dino synth style sounds. Okay. Dino synth. It's gonna, it's gonna go on his Diplodocus album. Diplodocus is the um, the dinosaur that's out front of the Carnegie Museum in Pittsburgh. Dippy, yeah. That's Dippy the dino. Mm -hmm. I saw. I walked past uh, a couple days ago. He has his scarf on, ready for winter. Uh, they put that on him every year. He's uh, <laughs> he's plastic. Did you know that? No, I had no idea. I don't think I've ever touched him. He, he doesn't necessarily feel plasticky, but I heard he's made to hmm. cast out of some space age plastic or something. So he's light. Okay. If you're going to make a, a sculpture that big, they don't necessarily make them out of heavy metal anymore. No, I can imagine. And that's a big sculpture. The thing is huge. Yeah. It's like the size of, I don't know, like a dinosaur. <laughs> Yes, it is. All right. We're going to do this. Yotis, this is the one I don't know if you're going to need headphones for because um, it's, it's, it's a visual adventure today is what we have in store for you. Oh. I think it's easy to understand. It, it, uh, it's not like an oscilloscope module, though. I mean, it's designed, it makes, it's best understood by looking at it, I think. The learning of the module is, oh, how'd you do that? Um, it's a camera. <laughs> <laughs> I think understanding the module is best done visually, but after that, you could turn off your scope and just listen to it. Yes. Okay, let's, three. Uh oh. All right, welcome everybody to my basement, my uh, bunker in the basement here. Today I have, as a very special friend, guest of the show. Uh, he is Pittsburgh Modular, really. Michael Johnson. This is where the applause oh. would be. <laughs> Pot that up. <laughs> Michael, like, uh, a, like a true shock jock. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, you know, it's it's an exciting day here at the uh, the COVID bunker. I Michael is the analog engineer, Pittsburgh modular. He's I I tend to get all the credit, um, although I try to deflect it back to him as much as possible. Uh, he's the one that does the the really dirty work and. <laughs> and solves the really, really hard problems that I that I casually ask him to solve in passing. And it, it, an amazing, amazing job he does. Him between him and, and Perry and, and Ross, uh, I, I'm a very I'm a I'm a lucky uh, a lucky person with a, a great team. So today specifically, we're gonna talk about something that you came up with um, and we'll talk about the history of it first and then we'll sort of run through the module and explain 
why it does what it does, how it sounds, when you where it sounds best, all that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. And there's uh, we're gonna try to keep this shorter. Although I suspect, like all of these live streams, it'll end up being way longer than it needs to be. That's quite a great prediction. Yeah, that's, it's going to be longer than it needs to be. It, yeah, <laughs> it always, it always, they always end up being longer than they need to be. But I well, think the module is pretty easy to under, to, easy to get the basic idea of how it works. I, I think, I think we'll do a pretty concise job of that. But well, we could we could go through that very quickly. I could just throw the fader here and and really they give could the tune whole out. game away. Yeah, okay. yeah, that would that would do it. The TLDR version. <laughs> so let's let's talk a little bit about uh, the background of the flamingo, harmonic interpolation, center clipping, and overtones because the circuit itself is really a collection of three separate sections. Um, that chain together to give us the final result. So we could sort of talk about them. And the reason it's three sections is you, the second two kind of support the main idea, uh, which is center clipping. And, and mm-hmm. they're kind of there to solve some of the problems that center clipping creates. Mm-hmm. So what's center clipping? Is that how we're going to start? I think we should say what is center clipping and then maybe a little bit um, about how you got interested in it. Okay. Yeah. Uh, well, center clipping is a an idea that um, isn't all that f- familiar, probably to a lot of audio people or people using synthesizers. But everybody's familiar with peak clipping, and center clipping is <clears throat> really very similar idea to peak clipping. Peak clipping, as everybody knows, is one way to do that very simply. It's what we think of when we think of distortion, overdrive distortion. You turn a signal up so high that you turn a soft a signal with soft peaks into one with really sharp peaks and you literally cut the top and bottom off of the waveform and a waveform with sloped sides eventually becomes vertical sides and the tops and bottoms of the waveforms become rectangles. Um, that's what happens in your guitar overdrive pedal or in your overdrive section of a synthesizer and uh, that works because it the signal eventually approaches the power supply limits. So in a synthesizer, it's plus or minus 12 volts. The signal gets near there and it starts to square off. And then you can turn it down later on so you can have quiet distortion, but you have a quiet square wave instead of a really loud one. And so center clipping takes that idea and in a way sort of starts from the inside out. Instead of working at the edges of the power supply, you work in the very middle of the power supply, which is the zero volt line the line that's symmetrically right in the middle of a of a balanced wave. And you, instead of cutting the tops and bottoms off of the wave, you cut the middle out. Um, you want to show how that looks? Okay, so we just gradually cut the middle out of the top half of the waveform there. Um, and what's left of the wave gradually sh- shrinks down to zero. And you literally can think of yourself as drawing a a stripe across the middle around zero and removing that part of the waveform. And you can do it to the top half of the waveform or to the bottom half of the waveform. Just like when you do peak clipping, you can do it to the top half of the waveform or the bottom half of the waveform. And um, every time you introduce an asymmetry in the waveform, whether the asymmetry is top to bottom or left to right in the waveform, you um, generate or encourage uh, that that waveform then has even harmonics in addition to odd harmonics. So an asymmetrical waveform, whether it's left to right asymmetrical, like in a, a sawtooth, or top to bottom asymmetrical, like when we do one of these weird peak clipping thing, uh, uh, center clipping things, or peak clipping in a guitar amplifier, for instance, you have an asymmetrical distortion, you generate some even harmonics. And that's the basic idea of center clipping. And since it's a synthesizer module and we love voltage control over everything, we don't just um, give ourselves the option to do that with a slider. We can do it with a control voltage and make that control dynamic. So you have dynamic control over harmonics. Only you're working on the inside of the wave instead of the outside. Mm Mm-hmm. That's it in, what, 500 words. <laughs> All right, then. 
Is there uh, what what's the uh, the historical? Why would relevance? anyone bother with center clipping? Yes, is this uh, a center clip? This, this wasn't an idea that you came up with specifically. The center clipping is one of those things that shows up in the audio literature from time to time. Um, center clipping is something that happens uh, in an undesired way in um, power amplifiers, for instance. Um, in the early days of power amplifier design, you had what then is usually referred to as crossover distortion, where you have transistors in the output stages of a power amplifier, and the two, the positive and negative excursions aren't the same, and then you have little pips around zero. That's something undesirable in amplifiers. They call that crossover distortion, um, and it doesn't take long before somebody turns that into something desirable. Um, the place where center clipping shows up in, um, in kind of an analytical or, um, uh, what's the word, uh, in a more scientific way is um, in the study of speech, uh, speech and electronics, specifically in the telephone system, and then in like vocoding and speech synthesis and um, speech intelligibility. There was a lot of research starting around the 40s or so during World War II, when mm -hmm. everything was about the war, about how intelligible speech was in um, noisy environments, specifically airplane cockpits. <laughs> and so they were trying to figure out how could they make speech more intelligible in insanely noisy environments with a lot of crosstalk or a lot of um, motor noise, for instance. And one of the interesting, they f interesting things they found out was that you can... Um, peak clip a voice signal almost infinitely, which is to say you can turn a voice into square waves and it's still incredibly intelligible. But if you add as little as 50 or 60% center clipping, uh, speech starts to become unintelligible. Uh, and then center clipping became important in um, pitch detection, for instance, in all kinds of digital algorithms. They use center clipping to uh, figure out um, uh, pitch determination. Ooh, that's pretty. That's kind of fun. Yeah. Um, so it, it, it's it's uh, there are analytical uses for center clipping to help people understand how they come to understand speech, which mm -hmm. is arguably you know the most important sound in in our daily lives. Uh, certainly one that we're most tuned into, but uh, it's not a long stretch to. Um, to turn that into a creative tool for the generation of harmonics um, in a sort of flexible way. It's pretty dry, but yeah, that's sort of the genesis of the interest for me was that I used to do an awful lot of reading about um, how people understand speech. As speech is, you know, as we always say, the voice is the oldest musical instrument. So maybe understanding wh why speech has such an appeal for um, for humans, aside from obvious narcissistic reasons, is that we like to hear ourselves. <laughs> um, you know, there are also a sort of acoustical reasons for what is it about speech that we come to find so familiar or likable or whatever. Um, and it, it also seemed like a kind of a missing, missing ingredient. You know, we're so used to, oh, the obsession of guitarists with their uh, tube amp distortion, you know. Uh, mm -hmm. They're totally obsessed with asymmetrical distortion and the best way to produce it. And I always thought, well, there are other, what about the other methods of distortion? What other things can we do to a waveform that changes its shape um, uh, in a way that uh, it, it is maybe appealing? Well, this is it. This this method is certainly appealing, uh, but it's it's interesting because it. And we'll get into this later on when we're doing some audio demos. But it, I feel like it works best as uh, prepping a waveform for either some additive or subtractive. Mm -hmm. Yeah, as yeah. the thing before the thing. Exactly. Yeah. So it, to speak. It, um, it's n we've come to uh, as a as a company or as uh, as a bunch of people. We've done a lot with different kinds of wave shaping and distortions and things like that. And wave folding is something that we've put an awful lot of energy into. Um, 
And this can be considered another kind of nonlinear wave shaping that plays uh, really well with those. So center clipping as a part of a system um, uh, that involves, a, uh, think about sending this current waveform that's doing this sort of gentle center clipping and the, the way that it's adding uh, dynamic change and even harmonics to send that to a wave folder uh, or uh, filter it an awful lot. This is sine wave, so there's not a crazy amount of harmonics, but mm -hmm. uh, you know, imagine it uh, or send the folded wave into this, for instance. Yes, yes. Right. It's also in a way you can consider it a really crude kind of a VCA in as much as the waveform as currently shown also has a change in amplitude, right? So you can mm -hmm. th think of it as an amplitude control that um, has a simultaneous mm -hmm. change in harmonics. Well, gee whiz, that's what most real world amplitude controls are like anyway. You know, you hit a drum, there's a change in harmonics over the course of the amplitude envelope. Uh, VCA doesn't have, to, if you think of this in a sort of VCA way, mm -hmm. <laughs> Right, where you're turning it on and off in a way that makes the signal at one point quiet, at one point full loudness, and in between you have some changes in the harmonics. Well, a lot of natural sounds actually do that. So it's like a VCA that works from the inside out in one way of looking at it. Interesting. Interesting. And just, just to clarify, we don't have the sound on because I didn't want to drown out the talking with a, oh, right, sure. with a sine wave. So that's that's why you can see it because it's interesting to look at, and it sort of it illustrates what Mike was talking about, but at the same time, it's not uh, driving you crazy to have to listen to a sine wave. It also looks like um, dinosaurs holding hands. <laughs> <laughs> when we get to overtone, we can uh, you can make the bat symbol. So You're, You've got, that's your ace in the hole. That's it. That's what <laughs> I've got. So th this is... In layman's terms, what we're doing is we have independent control of, if I pull out the CV here and just mm -hmm. manually control, over the top and the bottom. And, and again, what we're doing is we're not attenuating it. It's It really is getting sucked in to the center. Right. So that slider is, you can consider it a threshold control. It says any signal that is... Uh, between zero and a certain voltage threshold is going to disappear. Mm -hmm. So it's literally cutting out a band around zero. And sometimes that band is more positive and sometimes it's more negative. And in this case, we're doing it with uh, Rick's fingers. Yes, we are. And I think, um, and specifically to the Flamingo here, then if we did want a voltage control, we mm -hmm. have one CV input here that we can then assign. I have a sine wave from uh, the double helix, which is off camera here to the left. So that's the control signal. And that is, yeah, the CV signal. And we can control the positive with the CV. And you can see the, the negative then is not controlled by that. It's just positive. I can control the negative manually. Mm -hmm. um, we can enable the trough CV control and allow then that CV. So what, what the label that says peak and trough is the positive uh, half of the waveform and the negative half of the waveform. Yes. Like the top of the wave and the bottom of the wave. Mm-hmm. That's for the viewers at home. <laughs> That's an interview technique where two people say something that both of them already know because oh, they're really yeah. saying it for other people. Interesting. Interesting. For those people at home are saying peak and trough. Peak and trough. Where do the pigs eat? In the peak or the trough? Mm, they eat in the trough. So let's let's move on. And we're getting and you can see already the problems that center clipping creates. If we problems. If we go to some extremes here, you can see we don't have a waveform left. Exactly. Yay. <laughs> we and got now, rid of that. T tiresome waveform. So if we have, and I got to turn the frequency back up here. If we do add some audio. It, 
it just disappears. And you, so you can see why this hasn't been implemented in the past because how could this be interesting? Right, that seems like a touchy thing. So notice we get more harmonics the more we clip, but unfortunately the signal gets quieter. Yes. So it's more harmonic content, uh, but the overall signal isn't as loud because we're losing amplitude as we're cutting the middle out of the wave. Mm -hmm. So let's, let's move it. on to... <laughs> how are we going to solve the problem? <laughs> but before we get to that, let's talk, talk about the second section, which is the overtone section. Which one is that? This is where we can pull out. Oh, yeah, nice. Right. <laughs> For those viewers at home, Michael doesn't know what anything on the panel is called. Hey, how does it do that? <laughs> So we can, using the overtone, pull out the fundamental. Right, so what we're really, can I say what we're really doing? Sure. So when we're, uh, when Rick is moving the control labored, labored, mm, labored, <laughs> the one with the label overtone, what it's doing is subtracting the input waveform from the clipped waveform. And when we do that, we make it possible to actually remove the fundamental from the clipped waveform and we get this kind of um, hollowed out version of the original signal with just all those new harmonics. Right, so if Rick sets it just right, right, you can hear that fundamental disappear. Just disappears. Neato keen. Mm -hmm. And you get what looks like uh, a single folded wave mm -hmm. because that's pretty much exactly what it is, right? So there you can see the kind of um, overlap between this shaping technique and uh, classic wave folding, which we've done a lot, lot with already. But we have a kind of voltage control over the uh, loss of the fundamental or not. That's pretty good. Yeah, that's nice. Okay, there we go. Right, so you can hear that fundamental kind of bobbing in and out as the control voltage sweeps through the, mm -hmm. the threshold. So if we set both the peak and the trough, you can really hear it. Mm -hmm. Because it's symmetrical, yeah. yeah. And in many ways, the, the, just like with um, wave folding, um, there's a similarity now to the feeling of um, filtered sounds, right? Mm -hmm. Because what we associate with this dynamic filtering of sound is not so much what it used to be and what it is now, but rather that there's a change in the harmonics. It's an uh, evolution of the harmonics as opposed to Filtering sounds like, to, to me, filtering, I always think of spaghetti in a colander. You know, it's like a task. You've got water plus spaghetti, and you just want spaghetti, and you get rid of the, the water. But this is dynamic shaping of harmonic content. I've never thought of it. Always think of it it's that way from now on. Spaghetti in a colander. Or, or, for instance, when you put <laughs> red contact lenses on chickens so that they don't fight one another. Yeah, that's that was my second... <laughs> You're filtering their light so that they always see red and they get desensitized to blood. I see. Just for instance. <laughs> no, anyway, back to this. <laughs> wow, that was, that was good. Maybe the wrong tangent for the day. Wow, okay. Oh, boy. Anyway, yeah, so I this, is, we the, this is the overtone somebody. thing where we're basically making it possible to uh, really compare the, um, the center clipped waveform with um, the dry input. It's a kind of voltage controlled crossfade between the two. Mm -hmm. That 
And then this still doesn't solve our problem, though. Darn it. In a way. But do you want to introduce You still the, run into... What are we calling it? Drift? Focus. Focus. No, no, uh, but drift is the one that... Oh, drift, yes. That does the... Yes. Is that next, or...? We could talk about that now, yeah. Okay. So the control that we've labeled drift, as Rick just gave it away, you can see the sine wave moving up and down slightly uh, in a DC way, um, up and down from the zero line. And what that does is it introduces uh, a slight offset in the signal so that it hits the clipping uh, in different places because the clipping is determined exclusively by th uh, positive and negative thresholds. If you move the waveform to meet the threshold, um, you create another place for asymmetry and you can get the, uh, the classic cat ears uh, bat wave. Mm -hmm. It's a classic. K Kilroy the cat. And this is another, we have a CV input for this as well. Right. Uh, the so that's a kind of a guaranteed uh, asymmetry. <laughs> yes. <laughs> You're forcing it on it. Mm -hmm. And then when you do use CV, the uh, slider, there's no dedicated attenuator. The slider becomes the attenuator. Just to insert how this actually works on the module itself. Right. And that's in the manual as well in case that wasn't 100% clear. Mm-hmm. I worked really hard on, by That's the way. That's really nice color. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes. The key to this module, and the, um, it's, it's very easy to get very extreme results out of it, where you can push everything to the max and it just blows everything out and you get a very distorted sound. And you can move the distortion around a little bit, but that's sort of the extreme. What I find most interesting about all of the modes is the subtlety that exists in there. And how you can move things just a little bit and it changes how it sounds, how it looks, quite a bit before it totally blows it out. So I think the subtlety to it is really something that's very interesting. Yeah, I think that's one of the reasons it doesn't have a hundred controls on it either, is so that um, you can actually pay, spend some time with each of the controls. Mm -hmm. Let's see how they interact. And um, right now we're using very uh, slow control voltages, but imagine as well that you use very short control voltages to generate um, very quick momentary changes in the harmonic structure and then send that same control voltage to run the VCA on the signal and you have a very kind of evolving percussive sound, for instance, that's not like most drum sounds. There you go, something like that. And then you might, for instance, send this signal downstream to a VCA that's controlled by precisely the same control voltage or one that at least has the same start so that you could uh, maybe have a different decay on it. Something a bit like that. Mm -hmm. And that's coming from a sine wave, which, you know, is the um, meagerest of waveforms. Oh, that's nice. Yeah, that sounds very nice. it can be modulated at audio rates as well.
right, so there's a kind of a, a rich overtone structure that also has some of the modulating waveform as uh, sidebands in it. Are you messing with symmetry there? A little bit, yeah. And you can control the amount of the fundamental that sticks around depending on if you modulate only the top or the bottom, or if you use the, um, the overtone slider to try to de-emphasize the fundamental. access to a, a scope module or a standalone scope, it certainly will help you understand a little bit about how you're using the thing, but um, whether you choose to look at it the whole time, you're definitely going to have to hear it at one point. So. It's nice to see what it's doing, but it really is a follow your ear situation. It really is a follow your ear situation, yeah. So let's move on now. Let's get rid of this out the CV here. We're back to our sine wave. And let's talk about the harmonic interpolation, which is the last output, the interpolation output. And again, we have a sine wave, mm -hmm. which is excellent. But here, the difference is, as I modify it, the harmonic interp interpolation tries its damnedest to keep that waveform together and retain its size. Oh, there you go. Yeah, that's especially noticeable right there. Yeah, so if we slide all the way up to where there was really nothing left of the waveform, full, and I can pull this out and go back here, you can see there's nothing left. So that was the output we were using earlier where we were clipping it all the way down to zero and mm -hmm. then we made the thing silent with the uh, this is the second output that we've called harmonic interpolate mm -hmm. yeah what happens is that the the signal that was clipped now runs through an additional circuit that uh, tries its darndest to bring the signal up to a standard synthesizer level so it's a kind of a gain control loop that um, forces the signal into a standard synth level uh, and in doing so uh, adds some new shape changes as well. So you can see when we modulate it, out of the interpolate output, it maintains its positive and negative. Right, so it stays as, uh, its goal, its intention, its target is to make a signal that's standard synth level plus or minus five volts. Uh, and sometimes it has to tr try aggressively hard to do that, and other times its job is quite easy. this mode you can get some really nice chorus sounds there's a there's a lot of pulse width modulation type sounds in here mm -hmm. uh, really a nice way to add modulation without while maintaining pitch But because in this case the modulation is only working on the top half of the waveform, uh, there's a lot of even harmonic generation. And there's your two-humped camel occasionally becoming a three-humped camel. <laughs> the oh, that's fun. Try 
trough is going to just try to square off, and the harmonic interpolation is going to try to clean it up. But the CV, you can see... Right, so now you get these kind of uh, soft pulses that are modulated. This is a very asymmetrical waveform, but it's not just uh, rectangles. And the harmonic content evolves. So that's that's really the the harmonic interpolation circuit is really what pulls it together and and allows center clipping to work in the context of a modular synthesizer because it allows us to do these interesting things independently to the top and the bottoms of the waveform, but then it sort of regenerates the waveform in a way that is it's more easy to use really yeah. And it um, it would play well in a performance context, for instance, where you don't worrying about uh, oh god, am I uh, losing signal? Yeah, yeah. Right. So you're getting the harmonics uh, that you want, but without the loss of signal strength. Mm -hmm. That's the basic idea behind it. So, G Rick, why would we still have the plain old clipped waveform available if this one's so great? Well, they're, just be they're, fun? they're good answers for it, though. For If we want the sort of purely... If we take the purely clipped waveform, we can do stuff to um, to other kinds of inputs, like, for instance, to control voltages. Mm -hmm. Right? Since the circuit is DC coupled, we could use the purely clipped thing, the purely clipped output, and do all kinds of crazy chopping and clipping to uh, an evolving uh, sequence, for instance or a sample and hold uh, output, and we can generate evolving patterns that uh, the evolution of which is controlled by the clipping levels. That's actually could be quite rich when you consider that it uh, can operate very quickly on a control voltage. That's a maybe a, a less obvious use. Or send the clipped signal then to some kind of a slewing circuit so that you can also have uh, shaping changes. You could do point-by-point -point synthesis, for instance, and kind of draw a waveform with a, a fast clocked sequencer, and then do point-by-point -point waveform shape control with clipping. Okay, yeah. And f for those reasons, the clipped output wor is better because you actually get a, a true look at what the performance of this, the, the circuit does. Before mm -hmm. that kind of cool interpolated output, where you're always bringing the signal back up to five, if yeah. for control for a control sequence or point by point drawing of the waveform, you'd actually want want the signal to go down to zero so that you you get the dynamic changes. Mm -hmm. Or if you were doing that VCA trick that I mentioned earlier, you'd want to use the the clipped output only because you'd want the signal to actually become quiet. Yes. Yes. So there are good reasons to use both, and uh, that's why they're both there. Yep. Ta-da. Ta-da. <laughs> yeah. They all sound different. They do, and they, they, they're sonically very different. Yeah. <laughs> that's true, too. So it, it, it's simplest, you know, you're working your way from left to right on the three outputs through the entire circuit, but at any point you can stop and say this is this is the sound that I'm looking for. And that's usually that's the way pretty much all of our stuff is designed in recent years too, is that there may be some uh, relatively uh, there, there's some thinking behind the panel, but you don't necessarily have to think to use it because the Oh, there you go. Uh, 
Uh, because mostly you're just following your ears. You're making a, a change to a slider or a pot, hearing something and then following your ears. Um, not necessarily uh, operating it in this like very analytical way that I'm describing it. I have a tendency to to be a little too analytical in the way I describe something simply because that's the way it was designed. But ultimately it's supposed to be used intuitively. You say, that's a neat sound. What happens if I push it a little further? <laughs> oh, I like that even more. I'm going to go more in that direction. Or I'm going to back off and go back to that thing that I remember. Sometimes it helps a little to understand how it works, but a lot of the time you don't even have to. No, and here's an example of that. Uh, we'll still explain how it works, but uh, the focus button, which is the last bit we haven't talked about yet. Uh, right now it's off, and you can, you can see the waveforms are a bit squared off, a bit stepped as it slides through the uh, sine wave uh, CV controlled here. We turn on the focus, and it almost turns into what you see in that beginnings of a wave folder. Mm -hmm. So the, the, the stage one of a wave folder is, is what it, it really turns into. Mm -hmm. um, how that happens is, is relatively unimportant to your ears. It is, yeah. As, as you're using it in a musical context, um, if you're curious, we're sort of turning on and off the DC offset. So if there's any offset going into the harmonic interpolation circuit, we cancel that out with the focus. Mm -hmm. That's why you can see here in the oscilloscope that it's affecting both the top and the bottom equally because we've centered the waveform before right. it goes through the harmonic interpolation theoretically giving that circuit a little bit of an easier time but what happens is you end up with something that just sounds really different typically yeah yeah and it has to it's it's uh it's almost not worth describing technically how it happens um uh it's more important in uh, to understand that it uh it sounds different it's like um like a, a different organ stop or something it's another it's another flavor that's possible for the same re for the same reason on the new synths uh when you select a waveform you're selecting what i've called the seed because the geometric shape the raw geometric shape becomes less and less important that's right it really does so what happens earlier downstream is really less important so Right, it's a matter of, of what happens to it that ends up being more important than how it's done. So here we have a tremendous amount of Right, so you can, you can hear now how it does this kind of um, interesting flutter sort of a thing. Which doesn't really happen when we um, unthrow the focus switch. It really has to do with how that um, that gain control circuit works. The, the details aren't really important. And that's it. That's all the that's all the uh, the features of the flamingo. But I think where this module really shines. You only need one screw, just like uh, Flamingo only needs one leg. <laughs> That's right. I actually need both legs, because they get tired. You only stand on one at a time. But you got to give the other one a rest. <laughs> what we could do here... Drop this out for a second. Yeah. I think, it, and what really think makes this module shine is is to patch it as the module before the module so if we go into we go out of the flamingo into a wave folder for instance mm -hmm. and we're just using the wave folder built into captain big o which 
I think is a, a really nice circuit, a really great sounding waveformer. So here is the wave folder full off. So that's just the effect of the flamingo right now. Yeah. And that's exactly what we were seeing before. But as we fold that then, because there's so much going on there, it really gives us a ton to show. This goes back to almost some of the ideas we put into the original Voltage Lab. Yeah, that's the, right. The idea of cascading wave shapers to take complex waveforms and make them even more complex. Right, which I think a lot of people thought was going to be a really bad idea. <laughs> Slow down, man. <laughs> you don't want to do that. We did it. Why would you want to take something that was already and then make it more... But if you look at real world sounds, they are incredibly complex. I think one of the hang ups in analog synthesis is that everybody feels like they need to recognize a waveform. Well, they've, it's, the, it's been the same waveforms. That's what I mean. That it's, it's such a, an Im, impoverished um, sort of set of origins, a handful of waveforms. You really have to get away from from those descriptors, you know, and say, stop thinking about whether it's a SAR or not, and just sort of hear what it sounds like, and what kind of content it has, and how it changes. Yeah. Because ultimately, you know, when, when, you're talk, when you're trying to describe something like the Flamingo, or some of these new concepts, because there's no point of reference, we really do have to let go. So you know what? The original waveform's irrelevant. We're using a sine wave, but there's no sine wave left in this. Right, and I, and I think in that way, the uh, the term that you've chosen, seed, is pretty appropriate because it's uh, it's just the little kernel that helps to give birth to something that looks a lot different from the from the seed itself, like the the bit of dirt that. Uh, oyster turns into a pearl, you don't say what kind of dirt was that necessarily. <laughs> you know, you're more interested in the processing that happened to it. And the, the, the seed or, the, you know, the As, way Assuming form. that it, you feel like it is a pearl and not just a, a, you know, like a cyst or whatever, which a pearl ultimately, I guess, is like sort of a cyst or something. It is, yeah. <laughs> like a boil. Sorry, that doesn't sell this thing very well. No, it's not selling. So this I've switched from the sine wave to the saw wave just to give an example of right. a waveform that does have harmonics to start with. But we could even this is actually an interesting use because going into the wave folder, mm -hmm. wave folder, you're going into an amplifier. That's right. Yep. So this is a this is actually an example where the original clipped output and the overtone output can really add some interesting sound. So if we start with everything all the way up here, get rid of our CV and go in, there isn't much going on, but we can see as we bring it down and we'll a miserable little so yeah, we'll go. Now the fold is fully folded at this point, but we're controlling the amplitude of the waveform with the flamingo. So you can do some really interesting things just with that, right. using different sides of it. Because the wave folder, its primary way of deciding when to fold is how loud is the signal coming into it. So if you dynamically change, change the loudness, that is, of the signal going in, you're automatically rubbing up against the wave folder in an interesting way. People who say that a system never has enough VCAs, it, it is true, and especially it's good if you're if you think that a lot of your modules actually have VCAs built into them too. 
or things that are like VCAs. Oh, that's pleasant. This reminds me of those uh, those snakes you get for the Fourth of July. Oh yeah. That sort of start and then just create. If you want to go the opposite way. And then, of course, the overtone output. Right, so you can see already that the the signal coming out of the flamingo is sort of more, you would say, normalized. It uh, it doesn't change as much in terms of its size, and that plays a big role downstream if you feed it into a wave folder whose decision making is done entirely. so complex so fast you might also consider that um, you put a filter in between or something right so that you can uh, really emphasize upper harmonics by sending the thing through a high pass filter for instance or something like that are you talking before we go into the folder or yeah like you could put a between the flamingo and the folder, you might try filtering and see what happens. I think we could try that. Do we have something handy to do that? We certainly do. Or, you know, you switch the responses and see what you like. You may emphasize a part of the spectrum. So coming out of the high pass filter here. All right, so now we're really only working on the, if the, Flamingo produces a lot of high harmonics, then we've got something to work on because it's only those that find their way eventually through to the folder. Whether that's interesting at the moment depends on how we tune stuff. If we switch to the band pass, we might get some. Right. And you may use the band pass to sort of center the pitch of the whole thing by emphasizing a particular part of the spectrum in a way like uh, the way that a wah-wah does, for instance. We have a complex guitar sound, but it kind of focuses the sound by putting a band pass characteristic over it. Mm -hmm. Right? There you can hear that clearly happening is that you're kind of working through the spectrum. Yeah. But that's the game of synthesis, right? It's a sort of making of har making and making harmonics and taking them away. Mm -hmm. I typically run when I when I'm using this, I have the dynamics controller from the voltage lot that I typically use as my DC low pass gate mode. Right. Uh, the filter mode of the voltage lot that I use as my DCA. So that naturally kind of rolls some of that sharpness of exactly. high frequency harmonics off. Yeah. You can absolutely do it with the filter. Just just pull them off just a little bit. And there's still so much complexity in there. Even turning the the wave folder down, or we could even just, for the sake of cleanliness, mm -hmm. cleanliness, pull it out, and just go. Where do you put cleanliness? Cleanliness in your rack? I put it next to godliness. 
So now we'll just, we have a filter here. We're in low pass filter mode. Mm -hmm. So wait, it's flamingo into filter? Flamingo into filter. We have a saw wave into the flamingo. That's the entire signal chain here. Mm. That sounds incredibly pleasant. Right? So there's a kind of a, a formant feeling there, you know, a bit like a overtone singing or something like that. Uh-huh. Plays well with voice, maybe? Yeah, you mentioned that earlier. I haven't tried it with the microphone. No, I mean, this this particular song is voice-like to me. Oh, so yes, 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 yes. There's a voiciness to it, isn't there? I think there is.
I guess that is true because he does uh, my dual bandpass module has resonance. All right, I stand corrected. Why do you think he built all those filter banks? Is because he was basically hot on formants. He was queer for formants, as they say. About an hour. Neato. Yeah. That started the, a little early. That's but the formal presentation. Later. Maybe there's, if there's a, a something we can answer that somebody, that we did a poor job of explaining that somebody needs clarification on or something. Yeah, absolutely. So if there's any questions in the chat, uh, just add us in the chat so it shows up yellow and we can see it. Uh, but now's a great time to ask. Michael, any questions, or if you have questions for me, you can certainly ask me, and I will ask Michael to answer it, <laughs> because he's here. lucky in the sense that because this was designed with an eye towards the Voltage Lab 2 and all the other features that are in the that first oscillator, mm -hmm. uh, we had to sort of pick the hits, so to speak, and say, okay, here's, here's what we can do. Now, this module, it breaks it out in a little bit of a different way. So this module actually has more... It has more controls than a will probably be in the in the upcoming voltage lab but the um the it sounds the sounds are in there they're just it, it's the nature of a of a whole instrument that you have to embed some of this stuff oh neato The input t attenuator is actually yeah. really interesting, and then you can correct me after I give the wrong answer. No, I'm sure you're but right. Because of because of the harmonic interpolation circuit, which is always trying to boost a signal back up to your rack level, mm -hmm. you can really create some interesting sounds just by giving it almost nothing. You give it, a, you, you sort of starve it, and it's forced to work harder. If that makes sense. Sounds mean. It is mean. It's like um, what they do to those horrible civet cats. So you can hear the waveform is staying the same size, but as I change but the Rick is attenuating level. the amount of signal that feeds the thing. He's using that input attenuation. Rick has found a 
an exceptionally interesting place that that's manifested. Um, when you use that automatic gain control output, the uh, interpolate output, you're s sort of starving it by uh, attenuating the input signal. And that can be voltage controlled as well. There's no voltage control directly for it on the module, right. but simply throw the signal through a VCA before you go into exactly the Exactly right. And you have voltage control over that. Yes. Yes, exactly. Yeah, do you hear what it did right there? That little chuff? Uh-huh. Yeah, that's it. Just getting started. Which is uh, kind of pretty in itself. Now when you're throwing the, the, is that the focus switch you're throwing? Uh-huh. Yeah. You can see that it's um, it's having an even harder time coping, and you get this sort of very rapidly pulsed kind of a thing, which is very nice in itself. And then this, what we're hearing now, is actually the modulation oscillator. against is the case of folding square waves because you're um, folding a brick wall back on itself and really mm -hmm. just attenuating the signal but um, uh, we found a way around that in most of our wave folders so that we um, we make it possible to fold the square harmonics without actually um, getting that null effect so really, really, any anything will fold okay. For the most part, yeah. But it's also a matter of taste. I mean, um, uh, to say that one wave form folds better than another is like saying one sandwich is better than another. I, I, I think uh, some people gravitate towards sounds other people don't like or... Um, some people hate simple sounds. <laughs> no, I mean, you, you. I don't think you can really generalize about what people like or don't like. No, of course I, not. I, I think modular synthesis is, is there for people who uh, obviously have a, enough of a, a chip on their shoulder that they, they want to shape waves in uh, a thousand ridiculous ways. They're not necessarily happy with the off-the-shelf sound. Otherwise, mm -hmm. they wouldn't want all those knobs in front. That's nice. I thought I would play a couple notes. Oh, Jesus, a change in pitch? I don't know if I can handle that. Just for 
That's we exceptionally could tr- pleasant. We're going to try it. And this is something that when you're listening to the Flamingo drone, you don't really, you can't capture, is how uh, natural these tones sound as you turn them off. You know, we're using a standard VCA here and a standard ADSR to add a little decay. But because the the waveform is constantly evolving and there are all those harmonics shifting around all the time, you do get these really great rich tones out of it that, that do turn off very nicely. Yeah, that is nice. Mm. That's rubbery. I like that. <laughs> Soft mallets. the one time I don't have the delay and the reverb hooked up. Uh, I don't have the cascading delay network set up either. Oh, darn it. Well, you get a sense, in the the dry form, you do get a sense of exactly what the raw ingredient is. Maybe you will like it better if you soften it up with a, a, a little bit of reverb, but at least you know where you're starting here. Yes. Well, oh, that's nice. And most of my videos, when I'm doing a either just a patch lab or I'm doing an ambient lab, um, there's I drench everything in effects. So it's it's nice. It's something like this. It's really focused on one module to to showcase what it sounds like on its own. So people can use their right. imagination to add the reverb and the delay. <laughs> or what you could do is put your speakers in the hall and listen to them from the other side of the building. You and could. And you'll add to some natural reverb. Oh, that's nice. I like that creeping low frequency info. <laughs> no, that's kind of menacing, but it's sort of uh-huh. s- sweet on the top and menacing on the bottom. That low frequency is seriously menacing. (laughs) It's just a LFO running at almost audio rate. Mm -hmm. That's good. That messes with your perception of pitch or rhythm. That's the harmonic interpolation flamingo, everybody. Mm-hmm. That, that's that's the. Uh, you said it was going to be too long. Was it too long? Um, yeah, it was too long. But that's okay. Nice. I think we uh, we both informed and entertained. Is it? say so we informed and entertained we did did. good yeah boy the captain bigo sounds great as well uh for for those of you watching that don't know uh captain bigo it's a create audio module that michael and i designed 
it, it really is a Pittsburgh module. Uh, the circuits are 100% ours. We did all the design work, all the testing, all the tweaking. It's the same. It's really uh, the main oscillator from the voltage lab pulled out into a standalone module. You have the wave folder from the original voltage lab. Um, you have all the wave shaping with the exception of the sine wave, which is the sine wave that's actually going to be in the voltage lab too. Right. So it's a newest, this is the only module we have out so far that has this cool sine wave in it. And then it has the overdrive circuit, which was a variation of the alpha circuit from the voltage lab too. It's just right. sort of an expanded version right, right. of that. Because there were so few voltage labs out there. We do get a lot of people asking us all the time about that. Hey, can I get the oscillator from the voltage lab? Yeah, th there well, it is. Well, you can, and it's it's also like ridiculously cheap, right? It is. It is. <laughs> and it has, it has Captain Bigo on it, so it looks it looks kind of ridiculous as well. Um, I, I drew the Captain Bigo, so it's fine. I definitely um, hunt a shark with him. I think you would. <laughs> I think you would. We well, had it does. It sounds r really nice, and it's in a it's a great shape and form, and would um, be extremely useful all by itself. I'm it's, a fan. It's a great oscillator. And the nice thing about it, and this is something you couldn't do in the voltage lab, the wave folder and the drive circuit can be broken out and used they can be independently patched yeah yeah that's right so that's how we were coming out of the sine wave into the flamingo into the wave folder earlier because you can just pop it in anywhere you want you know modular <laughs> uh, and uh pete is it pete uh, pete thomas you're right flamingo does mean flaming in portuguese And I knew, you probably know this off the top of your head, but I, I've forgotten. Um, I knew what a group of flamingos was called. I don't, actually. How embarrassing. It's wonderful. I can't remember what it is. Danielle's probably going to text me tell me, because she's the one that Googled it. But it, She's um, our lifeline. Did we get a lifeline on this game show? She did text me once and say you were too quiet. No. But there was nothing I could do because your gain is totally up. You were on a roll, so I didn't want to jump in. No, I, I don't know what a group of flamingos is called. But I did read um, before we went on air that um, the ancient Romans ate flamingos a lot. Which, um, I'm not sure, uh, I'm not sure what to say. Uh, one of these recipes um, suggests that you, if you can't get flamingos to substitute Another thing to think about the ancient Romans, in case you uh, you wanted something else to be angry at them for. They had some uh, interesting ideas. Ah, <laughs> oh, flamboyance. Yes, see, Danielle chimed in for us. Oh, of course. Oh, of course. Thank you, Danielle. What else could it be except a flaming, flaming, f flaming flame of flame birds? <laughs> Flamboyant flame. A flicker. I did that backwards. Yeah, you stopped it. It's not fun anymore. some ring mod living in there somewhere it feels like yeah well i mean it does it is a kind of an amplitude modulation right ring modulation is balanced amplitude modulation and this is a kind of an amplitude modulation that's asymmetrical and unbalanced but yeah sure a lot of this 
wave folding, uh, center clipping, you can consider it a part of the sort of bigger family of modulators. You get those lovely metallic qualities right now. Similar stuff sometimes to what you get from chorus type effects. Very short delays. Mm -hmm. see a second run of these uh, but again because the idea of these safari modules is that they're meant to be a way for us to experiment a way for us to test out larger ideas or small pieces of larger ideas that we're going to use in upcoming instruments uh, the flamingo for example is going to be in the voltage lab too as part of the first oscillator uh, so it's they're really all of, and all the Safari modules are like this. They're really just a way for us to share some of these little cool ideas that we've had that we find really interesting. Um, that you know, maybe they could they can stand on their own in different contexts. So that's the flamingo. Not sure when I'll be back to talk about another, but but when that is. Um, I'll be here. I, I do uh, ambient drone labs periodically. Uh, it's sort of last minute things in the evenings, mostly the later, typically around 10 or 11 at night is when I normally start. And they usually go on for an hour or two, uh, but I, there's no schedule. They, I kind of do them when I'm available. And yeah, that's all I have. To, I don't really have anything to shill. Check out the Captain Bigo. It sounds great. Check out the Flamingo. I think it's very interesting, and I think it sounds really good. Um, yeah, that's all I got. Thank got you. Else? Thanks, everybody, for uh, all your interesting questions. I uh, unfortunately can't read them right now. <laughs> They're just a little bit too far away, and I'd... But I'll look at them soon. Send Excellent. us a note if you have other questions about it. I'm happy to answer them, or if you have ideas about what you think might be interesting for us to do. A lot of these um, modules, as Rick said, are w ways of getting some sub-ideas out into the public and getting some feedback about them before they get interrogated into larger instruments or before they find their way into a, another module down the line. So mm -hmm. telling us what you like or don't like or that you found some interesting way of using them that we hadn't thought of. Um, helps us make better stuff. This is the best idea yet. The next ambient lab should be Richard droning and Michael talking about random stuff. Random stuff. That is a great idea. I don't, I don't need to hear my own voice that much. Maybe I can do it in a way that I don't actually get to hear my own voice. Okay. We can run your voice through the flamingo. Nice. And then we can render me unintelligible. Yes. Paul, no, Michael does not have a channel uh, or stream. Uh, you don't do any live streaming, do you? I did this. Did that. <laughs> I did this. It's like when people come to the trade show and you show them your new instrument and they say, "What are you? What are you? What's coming up?" <laughs> it's like we have this. This. Yeah, but but what's this right now? What's what's next? What's like next? I just spent. What's next is um, I ride my bike up the hill. <laughs> That's what's next. I just spent two years of my life on this thing. <laughs> You've given it no thought. I appreciate that. <laughs>